Today, in this first official lecture in our class, uh, we're starting with our standard 2.1, which is talking about the codification of, of religions that are going to work on uniting and bonding uh, societal groups. Um, and once they're codified, once they're written down and they can be transported, they'll spread to, to greater reaches. Uh, and to start talking about this, uh, we're going to deal with arguably the most influential religion that has ever developed on the planet, and that is uh, Judaism, Jewish monotheism. So we're going to talk, and, and influential because of much of what we're going to talk about as the year presses on, right? Uh, we're going to deal with the development of Christianity, which could not, of course, exist without a Jewish faith preceding it. We're going to talk about Islam, which would not exist without a Jewish faith preceding it. So uh, we're going to start with the development of Jewish monotheism. That word monotheism, please be familiar with it. It is what? A one God faith. A one God faith. Uh, as uh, as uh, compared to polytheistic religions, which we will talk about a polytheistic religion in a little bit today, uh, a many God faith. All right? So one God versus, versus many gods. Uh, so we're going to talk about the development of Jewish monotheism and how the Jewish scriptures will ultimately be codified, be written down, so they become portable. And that's, uh, that's really important. Uh, the origins of Judaism begin in the Middle East in a region of the world that we could call the Fertile Crescent or Mesopotamia. You guys remember that, that phrase from, from last year, the land between the rivers? Uh, with a man named Abraham. Now, uh, you guys have probably all heard of this fellow Abraham if you are in the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition yourself. Um, because the founder of the Jewish faith, Abraham, is the same guy that is seen as the patriarch of the Christian religion, the patriarch of the, of the Islamic faith. Uh, he is one guy who, around about 4,000-some years ago, was told by God that there is only one God, and that one God should be worshipped by Abraham and his followers, and to spread the word on that. Judaism, because of that connection with Abraham as its patriarch, as its initial uh, uh, prophet, all right, a prophet is anybody that speaks to God. With Abraham as that original prophet, it is known as an Abrahamic religion. Abraham is the first God. Christianity sees the same thing. It's an Abrahamic religion. Islam, same thing. It's an Abrahamic religion. Although in Islam, where Arabic is the, is the sacred language of Islam, we often, instead of seeing Abraham, we see Ibrahim, but exact same guy. All right? One note on Abraham. Where can you guys read about Abraham? In the Bible, right? Or in the Quran, uh, in, in Islam. The Torah for Jews, the first five books of the Christian Bible. That's where we would read about Abraham. Where else can you read about Abraham? Yeah, world history books, sure. In any books, written commentaries on the Bible or the Quran or the Torah, you would read about Abraham. Can we pick up a newspaper from uh, the city of Ur, where Abraham was from, from the time that Abraham lived? Nope. Nope. Are there any contemporary? Ah, that's a word we might not know. The word contemporary. Anybody? Yes. Modern? Not so much modern. Contemporary is at the same time, period. So, Mr. Crossan is a contemporary of me. All right? Uh, Abraham Lincoln is a contemporary of Jefferson Davis. They lived at the same time. Right? Are there contemporary accounts of Abraham that exist? No. There's nothing at all. The Bible, the Torah, the Koran that will write about, have writings about Abraham. When were those written? Yeah, yeah not, but not as many thousands of years ago as Abraham lived. The, the Torah, we're going to talk about that being written out. That's happening in about the 6th century BCE. So about 2,600 years ago. The Bible, the Old Testament of the Bible, well, that's the Torah, 6th century and after, the rest of the books were written. 
And then the New Testament, of course, couldn't have been written before the life of Jesus, so that is younger than 2,000 years old. When was the Quran written? Anybody with a guess? We haven't talked about it yet. Anybody, you know? Yeah, almost well. Muhammad lived in the 600s of the Common Era, so that's about 1,400 years ago. The first Quran actually wouldn't be compiled because originally it was all oral. It was all, the, all orally transmitted, spoken words. First Quran won't be actually written down on the paper in a book form until 650 uh, BC. So, or CE, pardon me, in the Common Era. So these are relatively young. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. Do we have his birth notice in the newspaper? Nope. Do we have his obituary? Nope. So how do we know he really lived? That's a tricky question, right? How do we know you have existed if we have no evidence that we can hold on to or look to that you existed? In fact, the only evidence we have of Abraham's existence is the Torah or the Bible that were written centuries after Abraham lived his life. And this is where this portion of our class is where we're talking about religious belief and the historical record. And the problem is, the further we go back in the historical record, we have less evidence. We have less documents. We have less things that we can hold on to that say, yeah, Abraham, that was a guy, right? Because what has happened to much of that evidence over the years? been destroyed, fires, floods, people just trashing stuff on purpose, accidentally losing things. Who knows? We just don't have those records. And that's when we talk about religion in here. We're going to talk a lot about religious beliefs, right? And that's the reality of, of religion is much of it we have to believe, right? Because we don't necessarily have the historic evidence, the verifiable evidence. For those of you in here that are Christians, Christians, a, a central tenet of Christianity is that Jesus lived, and Jesus, real historical figure. Whether you are a Christian or not, there is no denying um, the historical evidence of the existence of Jesus. Uh, Muhammad, as the final prophet of God to the, the Islamic faith, real historical figure that existed in times that we have actual records that that show that Muhammad was there. We know that that is historical, viable, viable fact. But when it comes to the religious nature of these two individuals, how do we know that Muhammad is the final prophet of God? Well, that's something that one has to believe, right? How does one know that Jesus is the Son of God and died for sins and then rose after he was buried inside a tomb? That's something we have to believe, right? Because we don't have, now like, now, there's our, well, the Gospels provide historical accounts of people that said this. Okay, sure, sure, we see that. Um, but there's, like, if, if you had to have that held up in a, in a court of law and show, like, evidence of it, that would be a little tricky, especially 2,000 years after the fact. It's even harder for a guy like Abraham, 4,000 years ago. So we don't have what we could call extra-biblical. Extra means like outside, like extraterrestrial. It's E.T. from outside of our earth. We don't have any extra-biblical accounts of Abraham. But the Abrahamic faith that was born with Abraham and his spreading the idea of one God, that eventually becomes Judaism, which is arguably the most influential religion that has ever existed. Because Christianity will follow that in that same line of Abraham, and then Islam will follow that. And between Christianity and Islam, that's more than half the people in the world practicing those two faiths today. More than half of the seven billion people in the world are either Christians today or Muslims today. And they all tie their history back to this figure 2,000 years before the Common Era named Abraham. All right, we're not a biblical history class. We're not going to focus much on Abraham's life, right? Uh, we are going to fast forward many, many, many centuries to around about the 8th uh, century BCE. Do you guys see, um, or actually, let's, uh, let's fast forward a little bit more. 
You see this building here. This is a temple that would be built in a homeland of the Jews um, in a city that still exists to this day called Jerusalem. And this is the Temple of Solomon because it was constructed by King Solomon of, of the Hebrew people. All right? Solomon was one of the... the their, there's a few kings of, of the Jews that history remembers. Uh, you guys probably have all heard of King David. Uh, if you know the story of David versus Goliath, that's King David. Um, Solomon uh, predated David. So Solomon was first, then David, and then another guy named Saul. Uh, so King Solomon uh, had a temple built in Jerusalem. And this was like the holiest site within the Jewish faith. In this temple, it was believed, or is believed, Indiana Jones was on the look for it. This is where the Ark of the Covenant, if you are a Raiders of the Lost Ark fan, this is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept inside this temple. That Ark held uh, the, the Ten Commandments as given to Moses from Jesus. You're familiar with this. Don't open it up if you ever find it, because it makes your faces melt if you look at it. Um, or least, you, you guys are familiar with this film, right? Raise your hand if you've never seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh my gosh. YouTube, you cannot see that more than 50%, raise your hands again. 65% of America's youth in high school today has not seen the first Indiana Jones. Raise your hand if you've seen the Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull one, the more recent one. Okay, good. At least they haven't seen that one. That's, that's fine. All right, so anyway, so this temple is in Jerusalem. And it is like the central place for the Jewish priests to lead their faith. All right? And this is where the Jews are spreading this one God idea to their people. Things start to get really rough, though, in the 8th century BCE. As a group of outsiders called the Assyrians will move from the region of Mesopotamia into this kingdom of the Jews. All right? These are the Assyrian people. Now, a truism from what you guys might have picked up last year in AP and when you first started AP World. Remember you talked about the River Valley civilizations? You guys recall the Nile River Valley civilization? Egypt, you know, a little bit about that. This is Mesopotamia. We're talking about the land between the rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. You guys remember that probably. Uh, you might remember um, the Shang uh, civilization uh, in the Wang He River out in China. You might uh, remember the Indus River Valley civilization in what is today India and Pakistan. You guys, you guys remember these? Okay, one issue with this part of the world, this Mesopotamian part of the world, is there weren't any good natural boundaries. All right? You didn't have lakes or seas or mountain ranges that kept people comfortably separated from each other. You had a lot of wide, relatively wide open expanses that were hard to defend. So through the history of the Middle East, we get empire after empire after empire after empire. One conquering another, only to be conquered by another later, only to be conquered by another later. For our purposes in AP World, we do not have to memorize these guys. But a couple of the names you know. You probably remember hearing or reading about Sumeria. And in fact, I think you might have come across that in your book last night. Sumeria, the Sumerian people. Uh, you might remember uh, hearing about the Babylonians and, uh, and Hammurabi's code. You guys remember kept picking that up last year? This like legal code that, that, that King Hammurabi wrote and it create, showed us the social classes in classical Babylon. Uh, there's other groups, the Akkadians, right? Uh, the Assyrians are just another one of these groups that rise up in this region, conquer their neighbors, only to be later conquered by somebody else. The reason we bring up the Assyrians in AP World is that they came in and conquered one chunk of the Jewish kingdom, like the northern half of the Jewish kingdom, which would weaken the Jewish state. Later, another empire would come in and eventually replace the Assyrians. And these were known as the Neo-Babylonians. 
The Neo-Babylonians also sometimes referred to as the Chaldeans, although there is some historical debate as to the connection between modern Chaldeans, of which we have many in our community, um, and this Chaldean Empire or Neo-Babylonian Empire going back 2,500 years ago. But this is where your knowledge of some of this stuff is going to pick up. Uh, do some of you that uh, are very familiar with the Old Testament stories um, about like Daniel in the lion's den, or if you're, if you're a big VeggieTales fan when you were a little kid, uh, you might remember some of this stuff. When the Neo-Babylonians came in, they conquered what was Assyria, and certainly conquered the old kingdom of the Jews that the Assyrians had conquered, and they pushed even further, all right? When the, when the Neo-Babylonians came in, they conquered the entirety of the Jewish kingdom. And they went into the old city of Jerusalem, and they destroyed that Temple of Solomon. They smashed it down. Temple of Solomon gone. That's when we believe the Ark of the Covenant went missing. That's why Indiana Jones has been looking for it for the last hundred years. All right? The Neo-Babylonians destroy the temple and they will take prisoner the Jewish people. Now, not every Jew, but all the important ones. The priests, the religious leaders, the political leaders. They will be taken captive and marched across the desert in an event known as the Babylonian Captivity. Because they were taken captive by the Neo-Babylonians. And they were taken to the city of Babylon which is today pretty close to where Baghdad is in Iraq. During this Babylonian captivity, where Jewish leaders were taken from their homeland, their temple destroyed already, taken from their homeland, and taken to the city of Babylon, they will be living in exile. This is known as the Babylonian captivity. Some call it the Babylonian exile. It's about a 50-year period, all right, in the 6th century BCE. Note, 586 to 539 BCE is the 6th century before the Common Era. It is at this time, during this Babylonian captivity, that the Jewish leadership, the religious leaders, separated from hundreds of miles from their biblical homeland, their temple destroyed. It is here that they got together and started crafting what would become the Torah. Because prior to that, much of what they taught and preached and, and, and led in their services in the temple was oral tradition. But removed from their temple and removed from their homeland, this begins to be codified. This is the codification of religion. They write it down. The Torah is compiled. And remember we talked about this? The Torah is the first five books of the Christian Old Testament. It's the first five books of what we could call the Jewish Bible. Bible is just a Greek word for book. So it doesn't necessarily mean, like if you say Bible, it doesn't necessarily mean you're just talking about a Christian thing, even though the Christian Bible is a Christian Bible. There's a Jewish Bible too. It's a book. The first five books of that Bible are known as the Torah for Jews. And it is in this Babylonian captivity that they codify it. They write it down. And this is a huge step now that it's written down. Because once it's written down, it can be taken with you wherever you go. All right? It makes the religion portable. It makes the religion stable. So the Torah that was written 2,500 years ago could be the same Torah that you guys Google right now and find online. Yes, ma'am. So then were they both captured and exiled? Or? Yeah, it's the Babylonian kept. They were captured... They were exiled, they were taken from their homeland, and taken into, essentially, confinement into the city of Babylon. And it is there, in this captivity, that they put this down onto paper. Okay? So, the book is written now. It's written down. But, like the Assyrians before them had learned, the Neo-Babylonians are also going to learn that you don't get to be a, 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 an empire forever in the Middle East. And another empire will come on the scene and, and uh, do the same thing to the, the Persians, or pardon me, do the same thing that the Neo, to the Neo-Babylonians that, uh, that had happened to the Assyrians. They will conquer them. And so the Persian Empire 
the Persian Empire, and you guys can see it up on the map here, the Persian Empire begins in what is today the country of Iran. This body of water is called the Persian Gulf. The territory just to the north of the Persian Gulf is known as Persia. So the whole empire became known as the Persian Empire. Today, even many Iranians still refer to themselves as Persian. So this Persian Empire starts in the east, and it will expand to the west, overrunning the Neo-Babylonian Empire that they had created. And when they come in contact with these Jews who were held captive, what will the Persians do? Now I want to call a brief time out, and I want to get something into your, uh, into your, into your uh, dictionary here that you're going to use throughout the year. I like to refer to the Persian Empire and other empires that we're going to talk about throughout the year as massive multi-ethnic empires. They're big. They've got a lot of different kinds of people living in them. How do you rule a massive multi-ethnic empire? Various ways that we're going to talk about how different societies rule themselves when they, are, when they grow large, right? You can rule with an iron fist and make everybody follow your lead and make everybody practice your faith. And if you step out of line, what will we do to you? We'll smack you down. We'll rule harshly. Or you could rule like the Persians. And the Persian way of ruling was with tolerance, relative tolerance. Now, that doesn't mean you have to love everybody but you let them live the way they want to live. The two things that the Persians cared about more than anything else was keeping the peace and paying taxes. So if there was peace and you paid your taxes, you could do whatever you wanted to do. That was the Persian way, all right? And so when the Persians conquered the Neo-Babylonians, they let the Jews go free. They let the Jews go back to their home. And in fact, in the Old Testament of the Bible, the Persian king that did this, his name was Cyrus. Then the Jews referred to him in the Bible as Cyrus the Great because he did more for the Jewish people than any other non-Jew written about in the Old Testament. They loved the guy because he let them go back. And when he let them go back, they returned to their ancient homeland and they rebuilt their temple. This in Jerusalem is what the second temple of Solomon would have looked like. All right? So in Jerusalem, at the same location as the original temple of Solomon that was previously destroyed, they built a new temple. And they could go and they could practice their religion, even though they were living under a Persian empire. That's okay. They could practice their faith and live their own way of life. All right? Coolio? That ain't going to last forever. Because what happens in the Middle East? One empire comes, one empire goes. One empire comes, one empire goes. This is in the 500s BCE. By the 300s BCE, another guy comes onto the scene, kicking butt, taking names, and conquering lands. This guy's not from the Middle East at all. He's actually from Greece. He's really from Macedon. Um, and this is Alexander the Great. We will talk more about Alexander the Great in a little bit. But Alexander the Great will conquer the entirety of the Persian Empire. And he goes into Egypt and he conquers the homelands of the Jews. And he pushes all the way to what is today northern India, creating the biggest empire that humanity has ever seen to that point. But Alexander the Great dies. He only lasts about ten years uh, in his conquest. And when he dies, he divides his empire up amongst his top generals. And so now the Jewish kingdom is in new hands. Not going to have you guys worry about it. Um, and then as time goes by, the leader of this Jewish kingdom or this region that in includes the Jews started to get a little, little bit uh, difficult for the Jews to handle. He made them worship him like a god king. Well, if you're a Jew, how many gods do you believe in? You're just allowed to believe in one. That's the whole rule. So if the king is telling you he's a god... That's not going to mesh. And the Jews revolt, and there's a big, big war that breaks out, and there's only enough oil to light a candle for one night, and then it lasts for eight nights, and it's a miracle. This is the birth of Hanukkah. Um, and, and time progresses, and the Jews are still there because they win this little, little revolt. Eventually, a new empire is going to come in because nothing lasts in this region. And these are the Romans, all right? When the Romans come in, 
the Romans are going to eventually rule the entirety of the Mediterranean region, all the way around the Mediterranean Sea. We will talk more about the Roman Empire in a little bit. So if all of these empires coming and going is a little confusing, it's okay. We will lay it out in more detail on a later date. We're just really talking about the religion here, the Jewish faith. When the Romans come in, they take over the entirety of the Mediterranean region. In fact, they rename the Mediterranean Sea to Mare Nostrum. Our sea. They call it theirs. They've taken it over. And the Romans rule their empire in much the same way that the Persians ruled their massive multi-ethnic empire. Let the local people do what the local people want to do. If Jews want to be Jews, sweet. We don't care. You do what you want to do. As long as we're doing what? Keeping the peace and paying the taxes. But some Jews were not cool with Roman rule. They wanted to have their own independent kingdom like they used to have. In the year 70 CE, a series of riots and protests erupted. So frustrating the Roman rule, because all they wanted to do was keep the peace and have the taxes paid. So frustrating the Romans that time after time they were dealing with these uprisings and these protests that the Roman Empire said, enough is enough. And they would smash the second temple, destroy the second temple of the Jews, and drive the Jewish population out of the region. This is known as the Jewish diaspora. This event in 70 CE is the beginning of the Jewish diaspora. The spreading of the Jews from their traditional homeland, which is right here, to other regions. Some went north, some went into Europe, some went south into Egypt, or south into the Arabian Peninsula. So every single Middle Eastern nation, whether it be Egypt, or Saudi Arabia, or today's Syria, and Jordan, today's Iraq, today's Iran, they all had large Jewish minorities. All right? And they went, they left. Did their religion go with them? Yes. How was their religion able to go with them? Because they made it portable. They codified it back during the Babylonian captivity. So even though the Jews would spread around the world, the religion that would go with them would be uniform. Forever linking those people, even though they'll never see many of each other again, their religion will largely stay the same. All right? And their religion is going to go to all corners of the known world at this time. Into Africa, further into the Middle East, into Europe. How you doing, sir? Thank you. Questions, comments, concerns right now? Yes, in the back. Um, I just have a question. So you said that um, some of the people, some of the Jews, they weren't cool with like, the Roman Yeah. Empire. If at first with the Jews, Roman rule, they were like, okay, we're going to do what the Romans want. Excellent. So, Everybody's an individual. Everybody's got their own opinion. And even like this day and age, um, you know how there's, let, let's just, we'll talk a little politics right now. You know how there's some Americans that aren't really cool with, uh, or, you know how there's some Americans that are absolutely enamored with uh, the current president, Donald Trump. They're like, they love, they, they got the Make American Great Again hats and they go to rallies and they love everything about it, right? And then there's some other Americans that might not have voted for the guy and don't really like him very much um, and they just kind of, maybe post stuff on Facebook and they crab with their friends a little bit, right? And then there's others that, like, are actively protesting against it, right? That would show up to a Kid Rock concert last night to protest Kid Rock and his support of Donald Trump and vice versa, right? So everybody's got an opinion, and then different people have different reasons and different levels that they will go to in their frustration. So at this time, many Jews would have been satisfied. Cool. All right. We're living in Rome. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Okay, you've heard this phrase before. While others would have longed for their independence. And, and they would think about the time when they lived under Greek rule. And they protested. And they rose up in rebellion, in violent rebellion. And they won. And they got their independence for a brief time before the Romans came in. And they thought, maybe we could do this again. Now, is that everybody? Absolutely not, because most people just want to live to the next day, and they're not going to put their neck on the lines, right? Well, by 70 CE, the Romans had dealt with protests and riots over the decades, and finally they had enough, and they smashed that temple, and the Jews were made to spread. Yes? 
Um, this is a question about the very beginning of your lecture. Yeah. So what does Abrahamic religion mean? An Abrahamic religion is just any religion that has Abraham as the founder of it. So there, it's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All can point to Abraham as that first guy who had a covenant with God. God talked to him and said, Hey, Abraham, there is only one God, and it is me. Not me, but the God talking to Abraham. Okay? And Christians believe that, Jews believe that, Muslims believe that. Cool. Um, one side note, just uh, that might be of interest to you. When the Romans smashed that temple, and you guys can see uh, that picture right here. When the Romans smashed the temple in 70 CE, and the Jews spread out, that temple has never been rebuilt. That temple is gone. It's been gone for 2,000 years now, right? This is what's left of it. And you guys might have seen this before on the news. This is, has anybody ever been to Israel or Palestine? You've been there. So you, it, oh, you were just there. Wow. Um, and so were you here? Did you, go, did you go up here? Yeah. Okay, so you were up on what Jews call the Temple Mount and what Muslims refer to as Haram al-Sharif. Okay, very good. So this is a very interesting story that we're going to deal with as we push further in the year, and I just want you to kind of notice it right now. For Jews, the holiest site on the planet is right here. This is what's known as the Western Wall, or the Wailing Wall. It is in what Jews refer to as the Old City of Jerusalem, because it's literally old. Um, it's, it's the remnants, it's the old retaining wall from that temple that had existed 2,000 years ago. It's all that's left after the Romans brought it down. All right, It's all that's left. It's an important prayer location for Jews today. Uh, you guys can see this big plaza in front of it, and Jews will go up to the wall, and many of them will pray at the wall. There's ceremonies at the wall. There's, there's uh, marriages at the wall. There's bar mitzvahs at the wall, when like a boy becomes a man. All this stuff happens often at the wall. People put little prayer cards and wishes and notes inside the wall for God to see. So it's a very spiritual place for Jews. But since 70 CE, not that many Jews remained in this area. And then you got a couple centuries of Roman rule, and then um, where, where the Romans literally tried to scrub all aspects of the old uh, Jewish world out of the region. They renamed the region Syria, Palestina. They got rid of all of the old remnants of the Jews. All right? By the 7th century, with the birth of Islam and the expansion of Islam, According to Muslim beliefs, and we will read much more about this as we get to this point in our history. According to Muslim beliefs, Muhammad, the prophet, last prophet of God, the, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad went from the Arabian Peninsula on what was known as the night journey, where he was picked up by some magical beast and flown to what the Quran says is the farthest mosque. Didn't ever give a city or anything, but interpretation says it was Jerusalem. And he was taken here, and, and this building didn't exist. And from here, he stepped upon a rock and ascended into heaven. And this is in, in Islamic beliefs. All right. That rock, which is within this building now, became sacred for Muslims. And when the Islamic world eventually conquered this land from an empire known as the Byzantine Empire, we'll talk about them later in the year as well, this became a very important site for Muslims. And on the top of this, what the Jews refer to as the Temple Mount, like the raised land held back by this wall that once housed the Jewish temple, on top of this, the Muslim state built a couple really important buildings. They built a mosque, a house of worship, called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. You're probably in it. And then they built this building, the Dome of the Rock. And in that is the rock that it is believed Muhammad stepped on and, and ascended heaven. You saw it probably, right? I touched it. You touched it. So this is really, this is like, I, I just got chills from hearing you say that. Um, this is like a, a, a seminal moment in the life of a Muslim to be able to go there and experience that. Just like it would be a seminal moment for like an American Jew to go to Jerusalem and go to the wall. These are essential sites for, for these two faiths. Do you guys see, see how it could be prob problematic, though, to have two essential sites for these two faiths literally in the exact same location with questions over who has control and rights to worship in these areas? 
this is a big problem, especially in the modern day. We will talk about this much more as we go through the year, but um, know this location as, as being so important to both Jews and Muslims. That's awesome. I, I, I want to hear more after I'm done with this about, about your trip there. Um, one interesting note, this, and this is also a big bone of contention, this big open plaza never existed before 1967. Before 1967, this part of Jerusalem was in Jordanian hands. It was in Muslim hands. And then there was a war in 1967, and Israel took it over. And when Israel took it over, they destroyed all of the buildings and homes and shops that existed. Like, see this building here? And this building here? Those were connected. There was just a little narrow alleyway right in front. And those were all destroyed to make this big open plaza going forward. And many Muslims are like, no, because it's threatening their, they feel it's threatening their continued use of the site. It's a very difficult issue. Um, but land is, is essential um, in this part of the world. And who controls the land, who owns the land, has led to a lot of conflict uh, over the years. All right. Everybody good? All right, sweet. We're going to talk a little bit about another religion that is a foundational religion. Uh, and this one is uh, what ultimately becomes the religion of Hinduism. So if you want to call it Hinduism in your notes, but then we're going to back up a little bit before it is officially known as Hinduism. It's the religion of the majority of people that live in India today. One brief note for my trivia buffs here. When you think of Islam, you probably think of the Middle East. Is that true? Is that safe bet? Because the countries of the Middle East are predominantly Muslim. What is the most populous Muslim nation in the world? Yes, ma'am. Not Malaysia, but close. Indonesia. It's Indonesia. Indonesia. But Malaysia is another one of the big ones. India has more Muslims than any country in the Middle East. Pakistan is a massive... So most of the biggest Islamic nations in the world aren't even in the Middle East, all right? And so when we talk about India, and we're going to talk about Hinduism today, please understand that not all Indians are Hindus. Uh, there's a... And we have many Christian Indians in our school here, uh, but many Indians are a minority of Indians, but many Indians still... Remember, India has over a billion people. And so if you're talking about, like, 20 or 30 percent of India is Muslim, which is what the case is, you're talking about a population that's almost as big as the United States, all right? So these are massively populated countries. So we're going to talk about India, and we're going to talk about the religion of Hinduism, and how that will create societal bonds and shape how that, that society will develop. Their religion comes from outsiders. The religion of Hinduism comes from outsiders. And those are those Aryan people we talked about, I believe, briefly the other day. We mentioned them, I think. The Aryan people were Indo-European migrants. And somewhere around 1500 BCE, they made their way from what is today the very eastern reaches of, of today's Iran, probably down into northern India. All right? And when they come in, I want to throw a word on the board. When they come in, we are going to see an early example, like we will see throughout our studies this year, of... Syncretism. I want you to know that word. Syncretism. Syncretism is the idea that when two cultures come together, or when one culture enters another, they will each change a little bit. They will each become a little bit synced up. When you plug in your phone and you move pictures from your phone to your computer or back, or vice versa, you are syncing your phone. You are making them kind of the same. To be in sync with each other is to be the same. Syncretism is this idea that when cultures come together, we change. And we become a little bit like the culture we're moving into. Everyone cool with that? All right. So when the, when the Aryans come into India, they've got their own religious beliefs. They've got their own cultural beliefs. And fortunately for them... They have horses, and they are armed warriors on horses that are able to dominate the Indian population that they enter. All right? 
The Indians can't hold them back because they are not as adept militarily at this point. So when the Aryans come in, they dominate the culture. They get to make the rules. So they are bringing their beliefs from outside into India. Much of these beliefs come from, a, come from a, a writings known as the Vedas, V-E-D-A-S. Various writings that the Indian, or pardon me, the Aryan migrants will bring into India and becomes the foundation for Hinduism. Hinduism is the blending of these Vedic beliefs with local Indian beliefs to create something new. What is created out of this is a new religion that tremendously shapes the society of the Indian subcontinent. It is a polytheistic religion. So we've got a big difference here between the Judaism and Christianity and Islam that are monotheistic. This is a polytheistic religion. It's a polytheistic religion that believes in one overarching universal spirit. There is one, this is not a guy, this is not some bearded dude up in heaven or something like that. It is just a universal spirit that encompasses all. All right? And that universal spirit is manifested, or made real, I guess we could say, into millions of deities, millions of gods that are worshipped throughout the Indian subcontinent. So in some respects, Hinduism is kind of like a one god idea in that there is this one central overarching universal spirit. But then that is depicted in millions of gods to the point of where every Indian community, even every Indian family, might have their own god that they look to and they revere uh, personally more than maybe other neighboring communities. It's going to create a lot of division within the Indian subcontinent. The whole point of, of the existence in Hinduism, yes ma'am? Yeah, Brahmin, yes. The whole point of existence in this world, your belief system says, you as an individual will have a life. You will have a death. And if in your life you have fulfilled the duties of your station, of where you are, you've done what you're supposed to do, upon your death, your soul will enter another creature, another being, another person. And they will have their duties through their life. And should you meet your obligations, when you die, that soul will enter now. So your body that you're walking around in, is just a temporary vessel for your soul that is working its way through various levels of existence, all of them important, all of them with different roles, in hopes of one day escaping this cycle of life and death and life and death and life and death to become in union with Brahman. All right? Now, for those of us not steeped in this tradition, this is very complex and hard to wrap our heads around. But guess what? There's you know, 800 million people in India that practice this notion and have been doing it for millennia. I'm going to give you a couple words that you should associate with Hinduism. First, Dharma. Dharma refers to our obligations in life. Dharma is your obligation in life, your role. You have a duty, you have a job, you have a role to carry out. If you do your duty, you will have karma, good karma. This is a word that's really uh, been adapted into our English language, right? To have good karma kind of means like to have good luck, right? Is that how we use that? Cool. So if you fulfill your obligations, you will have good karma. And good karma means that when you die and you don't need this body anymore, you will be reincarnated into another that will be at a higher station in life. And then you'll have a new dharma. And then you'll hopefully fulfill your obligations and get good karma. 
and then you will go on to the next station where you will hopefully get closer and closer to what is a union with Brahman called moksha. And that gets you ultimately escape from this world of living and dying and living and dying and living and dying to this, this, this union. All right? Why is this essential for our study of like Indian society and how does this religion influence and create bonds within Indian society? The Dharma that we talk about, the obligations, these are strictly laid out by Indian culture, by, by the Aryan uh, society that they created. And it will become what we call the Indian caste system. In the caste system in India, in the caste system in India, there are various roles or, or levels of society, all of them essential. And often you see the caste system uh, kind of divided into this one entity. And here we see Brahma here, where at the top you have the Brahmins. Yes, sir? Um, sorry, I was just going back to what you were saying Yeah. They were the people that were already there. They were people that were already there. So in the caste system, in the caste system, at the top you've got the Brahmins. These are the priests, the guys that are most connected to the religion. They'll carry out the rituals. They're at the top. And notice, like, they're the head, the brain of this figure here. Then there is the warrior class, the warrior caste. These are the political leaders, the rulers, the warriors. Below them... Farmers, traders, merchants, people that are working the land, people that are building crafts. Very important in society, right? Um, and notice, uh, these are uh, pointing to his legs. And then at the bottom, you've got the laborers, doing the, the tougher labor within a society. Under all of them, under all of them, you have like a subcaste known as the untouchables in India. These are the people that would do like the dirtiest jobs in society, um, the you know cleaning sewers and such, and, and removing dead bodies. Um, every one of those jobs, you would have to believe, stinks, right? Literally and figuratively, you wouldn't like it. Why would you do it? You would do it because that's your obligation. And if you didn't do it, you would ever, you would never escape. All right. If you would never escape your level and you would just be there for another life, or maybe even go backwards, right? So you would do your obligation so you could be catapulted into the next level and keep on working your way up through the levels and eventually to achieve this union. Coolio? This creates for India one of the most rigid class structures throughout the world and throughout world history. You are what you are at birth. If you are born a laborer, you will live a laborer, you will die a laborer, and then your hope as a Hindu in your next life, you wouldn't be a laborer anymore, right? You wouldn't know that necessarily, but you wouldn't be that anymore. If you are born into the ruling class, you will live your life a ruler, you will die your life in the ruling class. You are not allowed to intermarry between them. You can't mess with it. You don't associate socially with people between castes. It's very rigid. You are what you are. There's no what we call in our modern society a hope for social mobility, a chance to move. Like you might be born into a poorer family, but you might be able to, through your life, rise up into a middle or upper class. Or you could go the other way. That didn't happen here. You were what you were. As societies became more complex, as societies became more complex, they created more castes or subcastes within these divisions. Those were known as jati, J-A-T-I. And one other note. These different levels, calling them castes is only because the Portuguese came. And the Portuguese looked at it and said, hey, you have a different class society where you separate into different classes. The Portuguese called that castas, and we've adopted that word as the caste system. The Indians called them varnas, which comes from a Sanskrit word meaning color. 
And I think I mentioned this the other day. When the Aryans came in, the Indo-European Aryans, they were lighter-skinned folks. And where do you think they put the lighter-skinned folks? At the top. At the top. And as you went down, you tended to find darker-skinned folks. Now, many centuries of people intermarrying, whether they were supposed to or not, started to blur those lines a little bit. All right? But these levels, these varnas, is where you were born into. And you would have your obligation, and if you met your obligation, you would gain good karma, and in your next life, you would increase and rise up to the next step. Okay?